Welcome back. So let's continue with the Jacquard coefficients. Why is it not called the Jacquard distance? Maybe on Zoom, otherwise, does anybody know? Why didn't we call it the Jacquard distance? Why do we call it the Jacquard coefficients? I see hesitating hands. So technically the notion of distance, oh yes, over there we have. Uh, I think because it's a scaled factor and not something that stays the same, no matter how big or small certain things are. Yes, that could be an argument. That is also an argument indeed. And there is one more argument that you can make. I don't know. What is the distance between two in the vector space, uh, a matrix, it's called the matrix space. What is the distance between two vectors that are the same? Zero. And here, what would be the Jacquard coefficient between two words that are the same? One, exactly. That's why it's also not a distance. But your argument is also valid. That's also a good argument. That, oof, there you go. So technically, the notion of distance, if you ask a mathematician, they are a bit uh, picky on that, right? You also means, uh, they also mean something that's called the triangular equality, uh, inequality, like in geometric means, going from here to here and from, oh, going from here to here and from here to here should be more than going from here to here. So you also have this kind of constraints. Um, but intuitively, it cannot be a distance. Indeed, you are correct because I lost my... Uh, what did I, oh, there. So you would be correct that here the distance would be one. If it were a distance, it would be one. If it's the same word, then that's just not okay. All right, so it's called the Jacquard coefficient for that reason. The higher, the closer, and the lower, the further apart. Here's an example of further apart with computer and root, where only the three gram UTE would be in common. So that's one divided by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So one eleventh, right here. So it's a very small uh, Jacquard coefficient, and here it was one quarter, which was a bit better, right? So this is much less. So co computer, if somebody writes root, nobody would think that root is a misspelled word for computer, right? But in the case of computer, then of course uh, you would think that. Okay. So in that case, we have a Jacquard coefficient of one half. One, two, three, four, five divided by 10 gives you one half. So here it's very clearly a spelling mistake. Okay, so again, it's the division, the, the ratio between the intersection cardinality and the union cardinality as set. If you have duplicates, you need to eliminate the duplicates and do not forget the dollar, right? If you, if you don't consider the dollar, then you will get uh, wrong results. Okay, but normally in exam questions, we remind you of the dollar. We, we have a tendency to, to remind you of that to make sure that it's clear. Okay, so one of the flavors that we could get out of that is that we could get the k-grams for the query term, and then we look them up in the k-gram index, and uh, we compute the Jacquard coefficients of the words that we see in there. And then we keep the terms with large Jacquard coefficients, and maybe we could even do a Levenstein distance after that with those with a large Jacquard coefficient, right? So there are very, uh, a, a lot of ways that you can organize things, but basically these are the building blocks, right? The Jacquard coefficients, the Levenstein distance, and so on. Now, uh, computing the Jacquard coefficients can still seem to be a bit expensive. Right, because you need to compute k grams all over the place and to count them and compute the ratio and you need to do it for everything you find in the k gram index. However, if you give a bit of thinking, then you will realize that it's simpler than it seems. Why? Because when you have a query term and you take the k grams, first you already have the k grams of the query term. This doesn't change, it's static once you have that. But then when you look up the, uh, the words in the k-gram index, you also already know the k-grams that the query has in common with uh, the word because this is from the index, you know that, right? Look at the index. Um, if you look here, for example, you have computer and you find computer, 
then you immediately see the, the kilograms in common, right? It's ER dollar, MPU, PUT, and so on. So, so you have them from the index, right? So you can compute uh, the intersection easily. And I'm coming back to where we were. So this is the uh, numerator, right? So this is uh, what you have on top. But now the denominator, it can actually be inferred with uh, just the uh, terms length. So the found term is the spelling correction, right? Computer in that case. We can actually be smart because you know this formula, right? How do you compute the cardinality of the, the union? It's the sum of the cardinalities of the two sets minus the cardinality of the intersection, right? You remember that? I see nodding heads, very good. So you can compute it that way. Query terms k grams, that's static. It's the same once we have the query, we know them, right? So we don't do it for every found term. Then the found terms k grams, we also uh, see them in the index. That's the one thing that requires a bit more work, but we find it in the index. And the intersection, we also have it easily because we know how we found the found terms, right? So basically, <clears throat> it means that we can compute uh, you see, for every uh, found term, the uh, the number of uh, of uh, k grams that it have, we can even pre-compute that. Technically, when we build the index, we can even have a pre-computation uh, of the number of k grams for each term, so we can really optimize things in there. So basically, if now I want to compute the Jacquard coefficient, I just use an uppercase J for that, completely arbitrary. But if I want to compute this, <clears throat> it's going to be five divided by seven plus eight minus five, right? So five is uh, the ones they have in common. One, two, three, four, five, you can find them here. Then divided by seven, that's the total number of K grams in the query, you see, look right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven. And here you see seven, uh, sorry, six letters. It's actually a plus one, you have six, letters plus one gives you the number of k grams. So we have a seven, and then we have eight, which is the total number that you have from here, total number of k grams in computer. And then you have a minus five, which is the intersection, which you also get from here, one, two, three, four, five. So this is how you compute this uh, fraction. For whom is that clear? So it's actually less work than you would think to actually compute that. So five divided by 10, it's the same result of one half. Um, <clears throat> what people tend to do in fact is to get the k-grams from the query term, look them up in the k-gram index, but they don't directly compute the Jacquard coefficient. Instead, they compute the edit distances and then keep the terms that have small edit distances. It might be confusing because I told you many different ways, but this is just that in practice, there are many ways you can do it, right? It's really building blocks, and then you're free to assemble it in any way that you see fit in order to uh, to end up with a system that works, right? And then you can test, you can look at the performance, how quick it is, and then and then adapt, right? So there's no universal methods, but every method more or less involves the same components for uh, for filtering the terms and doing the spell check, right? Um, <clears throat> Now, this is something completely different. There is also a way uh, that you can do spell check in a context, because here you say graduate form ETH. If I just put form, then that might be correctly spelled, right? You're looking for a formula, right? But graduate form ETH, how do you know it's a spelling mistake? Because of the context, because you would expect graduate from ETH, right? So in this case, um, you you could have alternatives here, right? That uh, that. Uh, uh, that, that, that you could have for the words. And what you need to uh, uh, look at is the by words, for example, from, from other users. So what other users write or what you find in the, in the actual text. And here you will see a lot of graduate from in the by word index, but maybe graduate form, maybe not, right? Maybe graduation form, but graduate form not. Then form ETH also not, but from ETH is more likely. So basically by looking at these by words plus the edit distance, then you can actually figure out that uh, that uh, that here you should uh, spell check, uh, fix form to from. For whom is that clear? I'm not getting in the details, right? It's just a high level idea here. Okay. Now I have one last item in this lecture, which is the uh, Soundex 
algorithm, also called the phonetic correction. In fact, I suspect that ChatGPT has that because I, I, I tried it when, when we, with things that it couldn't possibly know, but just with the, uh, the consonants, it figured it out. So how's, how does the magic work? Well, the Sandex algorithm says that whenever you have a word or a term, you take some sort of phonetic uh, fingerprint uh, of the words, the, the way that it sounds. This works for English. Of course, you could do it for other languages. Deutsch would, uh, German, uh, confusing German and English today. So in German, uh, it would probably be easier because it's a bijection uh, between the way you write words and the way you pronounce them. In English, it's a bit tougher, but nevertheless, the Sandex algorithm tries to do something about it. All right. Um, so here are examples of the Sandex algorithm. I'm directly giving you the algorithm on examples, and then you will see it's, it's going to be very clear. So I have a few random uh, queries here. Some are actual words, some are spelling mistakes, but this is it. And we are going to compute this fingerprint for every one of these six words. The first thing you do is you have this lookup table. It's always the same. That's part of the algorithm. Every letter of the alphabet is mapped to a number between zero and six. And this works like this. So A, E, I, O, U, so all the vowels actually are here and mapped to zero. H as well, W, Y, uh, they are all mapped to, uh, to zero. So let's call it the vowel, the vowel, um, actually you could call them equivalence classes if you want, since we've already talked about quotienting things. So you could say that we are quotienting the alphabet uh, into uh, seven equivalence classes in this way. Let's do it in a fancy way. So then we have buffer pervert. I think these are called the fricative consonants. Buffer pervert, it comes from the other la labial fricative, I can't remember. No, lab labial probably, buffer pervert. Then we have sir, j, j, k, sir. So it's both, uh, that's, yes, that's what sounds like se, se, cre. No, maybe not in English, cre. Um, actually, I'm not exactly sure. What, maybe it's just the garbage bin here where they put everything that doesn't land in any other buckets. But the next one is clear. That's the dental consonants. D and T are the dental consonants. Then you have L on its own. M, N, these are the nasal consonants because you, 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 have, uh, you use the nose to, to, uh, to pronounce them. And then, and then R has its own bucket. And then... Uh, yes, <coughs> excuse me, that bucket number two, bucket number two is just the rest. Okay, but anyway, this requires a bit of uh, linguistic analysis, right? So there are researchers and specialists of the way that we pronounce the, uh, the, uh, the letters and, uh, and we, we have a tendency to put them in this bucket. So the labial, the dental, the fricative and so on and so on. Okay. So we have this, and we are going to replace each one of the letters of every word, except the first letter, by the number. So here we go. This is what we get. So I keep the first letter, right? That I keep. But then the other, uh, the other letters are replaced. So you see O becomes a 0, M becomes a 5, um, T becomes a 1, U becomes a 0. It's a vowel. T becomes a 3. E becomes a zero and R becomes a six, right? And we just do it every time. So far, so good. Next, we remove duplicates, but not any duplicates, duplicates that repeat. So if we have, where do we have an example here? For letter, we have three, three. Do you see three, three? So this three, three gets squeezed into just a three. We eliminate these duplicates. It's really duplicates that follow each other that we eliminate, not if they are further apart, right? I think it's the only example here of duplicates that we actually have to eliminate. There's no other, right? But you, you see, uh, the important part here is that this, there's twice the same uh, digit here in a row and we just simplify it to just one. So now we get this. Then we remove the zeros, that's the vowels. We are only interested in the consonants, right? So we, we remove the zeros. Why did we put them in the first place? Well, it's because of the duplicate elimination. We, we wanted to have the zeros while we eliminate duplicates and only after that, we, we remove the zeros, right? Okay. <clears throat> and then 
we pad and trim. What do I mean with that? We want four symbols. So if we have more than four, then we just keep the first four. If we have less than four, we pad with zeros. So we have less than four for Z62 and L36. So we add a zero and the other ones, we just cut uh, trim uh, to just four. And there you go. You have now the phonetic fingerprints of these words, right? And so what Sandex is actually doing is that it, on the query terms, it's applying this and it's founding the, it's uh, computing the uh, phonetic fingerprints. And it's also pre-computed the fingerprints of every term in the index. And now you have yet another index that is where you can look up the phonetic fingerprints and look up the terms that have a similar fingerprint when you pronounce it, right? So that's how it, uh, it works, right? I have no idea why I did that more slide in there. Maybe because I like k-grams, right? And I just wanted to repeat that, that we, that we, uh, that we use k-grams for the, for the spelling. Anyway, so the Sandex algorithm, I, I think that you could basically apply it. It's just that you, you have this in mind, this uh, uh, quotients uh, of, the, uh, of the alphabet into seven equivalence classes. Okay. If you didn't every understand everything that I've been telling you, then there is chapter three in the book. And uh, maybe uh, the three authors did a better job than me explaining things. And then you have a different angle, uh, but it's basically the same thing uh, of uh, what I've been telling you. Maybe they have other examples, other ways of putting that. Who actually is reading the book so far? Very good. I strongly recommend it, right? You, you really should read the book. Then you have complementary angles. Any questions on this lecture before I move on to the next one? No questions in the lecture hall. How about uh, on Zoom? Give me a few seconds. Nobody? Okay, then we'll proceed. So as always, you know, we have the element chat. Uh, where you can ask questions. If you still not registered there, you can drop us an email to make sure we invite you. Normally we did a batch invite, uh, but you need to connect once for us to be able to invite you. Who is on the element chat? Most of you, okay, very good. So really you should connect to the element chat. It's a good way also to, in to interact in the class. You can ask also each other questions. Uh, the TA team and myself, we can help you. And also, you know, when the exam is going to arrive, then this is also a good platform when you prepare on the exam. Then you're not alone. You, you're on the chat, and everybody else preparing. And then you know you can just uh, also communicate over it. It's uh, usually something that is appreciated by the uh, by, by your predecessors in past exams. All right. So I'll stop here. See you on the other side.